Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus, the child of God of Extreme Metal Podcasts. I am the Death Metal Guy, a.k.a. playing Suffocation's Thrones of Blood on a continuous loop in the local Irish pub until the bartender threatens to kick me out. And I am the Black Metal Guy, a.k.a. every type of raccoon combined to make an unstoppable giant known as the <laughs> Omnicoon. <laughs> I... <laughs> uh, for me, it was uh, to be fair. It was actually a combination of suffocation and six nine songs, but Thrones of Blood was prominently featured the other night. <laughs> oh, did this happen? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it was a it was a weird night. I was out with uh, I was out with some boys. Um, only one was a metalhead, but uh, I was hanging out at his place, and he had a couple friends over. So we went out to an Irish pub called, and I shit you not, it was called Shenanigans. Oh um, Jesus. Uh, just some like dumpy little local pseudo Irish pub where we proceeded to drink car bombs and then realized that the jukebox had like fifty credits on it, like oh that shit somebody had like gotten drunk and put in a bunch of money and left or something and uh, I proceeded we just kept playing like suffocation and obnoxious hip hop songs continuously throughout the night and, and uh, they tried to kick you out they did uh. Well, the kicking out might have had to do with when two old men started fighting, and I kept screaming at one of them to swing, and that he was a pussy if he didn't fight at shenanigans. So, you know. <laughs> it, so it was probably a combination um, of a few things, but, you know. <laughs> f- fair enough. Well, sounds like it was. sounds like there were some shenanigans perpetrated. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I would argue that there were shenanigans afoot. <laughs> oh god my, oh, fuck my, my forefathers are rolling over in their graves <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah well mine too but <laughs> yeah. um ah um, oh, shit now we're doing like the weird shorter episodes I don't even know what to do like uh, it's, uh-huh. what do I, so I have to delete my my 12 pages of notes talking about black metal as it relates to Neon Genesis Evangelion because we're not going to have time for that. Uh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so like we said last time, episodes are going to be a little bit shorter, but we're going to be converting that into some new bonus content for you guys. Uh, so we'll get into some of the new stuff we're doing, but first off, the usual housekeeping, social media. Um, uh, follow me, the Death Metal Guy, on Facebook at Terminus Podcast, or the Black Metal Guy on Instagram at Terminus Extreme Metal. And then if you want access to some of that oncoming bonus content, uh, some of which will be coming out very soon, uh, feel free to subscribe to us on Patreon or Subscribestar, where $3 and up gets you access to all that bonus content, $5 and up gets you access to the private Discord server, and $10 and up gives you voting privileges to decide the subject matter for at least some of our bonus content based on a... uh, a highly curated list of uh, underground classics that uh, both of us love. <clears throat> um, but we were uh, we were talking a little bit before we got on the show about what we want to do for these opening segments. You know, maybe take a little bit more time. You know, give us the opportunity to do some stuff that maybe wouldn't entirely fit on the main show. And I think at least to start, we're going to use it as maybe a uh, a little slot for you know maybe some kind of briefer reviews of you know demos or uh you know uh, listener submissions that kind of thing just you know stuff that wouldn't necessarily fit debut releases maybe things like that you know uh it's um yeah so uh with that said why don't we uh yeah why don't we talk about this debut release uh yeah uh, so uh, this is the debut record uh, by Mondo Kane called Devala. Uh, and I think this guy hit us up like a few months ago, didn't he? And it Not just kinda... that long ago. Like, um, although, who knows? Time There's a time vortex. But, um, uh, let's see. Um, not, not, uh, no, October 23rd, man. Oh, okay. Jesus Christ. Look, I don't know. We've just been so around. busy. Like, yeah. We've been so busy. I can't. It feels like, oh, shit, didn't he send this back in June or something? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, Mondo Kane, uh, despite the name, which is a very unusual moniker, uh, 
given its relation to the classic Mondo Kane uh, exploitation film of the 60s or 70s. Um, it's actually a Swedish black metal, uh, a one-man black metal project. And uh, so the uh, guy behind this uh, was apparently the drummer of a 90s black metal band called Goat Worship, uh, which, you know, based off a little bit of research appears to have, you know, just on like a, a few demos uh, back in the day, uh, back in Sweden, uh, apparently got a compilation release of some kind last year on a uh, tape label called Pearls for Swine Records, which is pretty cool. Sounds like it would have been like a power violence label back in the late 90s. Um, so, I, yeah, I, uh, I, I gave this one a listen, but uh, in this case, you picked a couple samples. Well, actually, no, we both did. We were talking back and forth what to do. This is all yeah, new to yeah, us, I folks. Listened. We're <laughs> we're figuring out what I, we're doing. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah. Well, what did um, you, you think? What did you make of this record? Um, you know, I think it is, uh... I think the personality of the band is um, the central aspects to build out from are there already, um, you know. Um, so this is a band kind of built around timber. Uh, mm -hmm. and I don't mean like the wood, I mean like the sound quality thing, right? Uh, he, he builds this as mauling black metal. Uh, and from the very beginning of the record you can hear what he means and a lot of that has to do with two things uh he's got pretty pretty unique vocals uh which are basically like how do you take the attila sound and make it aggressive mm -hmm. um and he's also got uh he does the kind of uh, early Behexen thing and turns the guitars further down than you would expect for this style of black metal. So there's mm -hmm. a kind of um, and so it's like lower on the fretboard or maybe even down to it a bit and kind of unusually beefy guitar tone for this sort of thing. Uh, so that that is a good sort of focal point. Um, and I think then the question is how do you define the guitar style? Yeah, I, the impression that I get off this as the, you know, he said, okay, so I was in this band in the 90s called Goat Worship. I don't know if he's done stuff between then and now, but if we assume that that's the last stuff he was doing, then it's been a big gap for this guy uh, since he's been releasing music. And I get the sense that this record, um, this reminds me a little bit of the one we covered last year by uh, Sardonic Witchery. I was calling mm -hmm. it um, Sampler Platter Black Metal. Mm -hmm. The idea that every song is about kind of a specific influence. Um, mm -hmm. Every song has, a, you know, these are relatively simple songs, just just a few riffs apiece, a few uh, basic parts, but executed pretty well. But each one distinctly has its own personality. And I feel like through this record, it's him, okay, let's try this for this song. Let's try this for another. And this is him feeling out Okay, so of what I've done here, what are the two or three ones that I really want to concentrate on from here out? Yeah, so um, let's uh, uh, yeah, and I do, th I do think there are maybe one or two unifying tendencies in the guitar, but we'll get into that second. I think we should listen to your uh, the sample you pulled, which uh, I think we agree is just pretty cool. Oh yeah, the opening track "Blinding" is just super fun. It is just very, it's an unashamedly sort of like Sargeist meets stripped down Take kind of thing. The riffs are super elemental and just very straightforward. But god damn it, I'm never going to not like this sort of thing. <laughs> Thank you. 
yeah, I, I, that's it's just made for me. I'd listen to a whole album of shit like that, no question. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I guess for that, I, I do like the, um, I, I, I like that stripped down, barren quality of it. You know, I love just the fact that it is just this clattering thrash beat on the drum machine. Very straightforward, but like melodic and like immediately evocative kind of riff patterns. And uh, I do think you touched on something because you wrote it in the notes a little bit later. This guy does have an idea for how to establish like vocal hooks Mm -hmm. and for how to make like rhythmic vocal passages a, a central theme of these songs. Like, just the way he emerges back into that main riff, just going, blinding, blinding. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, such yeah, a yeah. simple thing, but it's a very kind of hardcore technique, but it's like, there's really no reason black metal bands shouldn't do more of that. Like, why can't we just have cool vocal hooks in our songs? Yeah, and, um, you know, it's rare to write black metal around the vocals, but I think that's kind of what's happening here. Um uh, without it sounding particularly poppy, although those are, of course, relatively poppy riffs, right? Uh, mm. But um, but they, uh, you know, I, I like hearing the riffs like that delivered with the low end and with the burly vocals. Uh, and as you said, uh, what was the word you used? It's got this kind of... Uh, yeah, it's very... Um, yeah, there's a stark simplicity to it, which is good. Um, yeah. And I think, um, you, you know, it's funny. I think you're probably right. Yeah, sure, Sargeist, Toka, or whatever. But also, like, I mean, riffs like that are all over the place now, right? So it's kind of a, you know, Rorschach test. But like, Who, Whoever you were listening it to reminded, last, you know? <laughs> It reminded me of uh, sort of like the old, the parts on the old Winter Filleth that sound more like Hate Forest. Mm, yeah, yeah. Like well, because he, he's got all those drone notes in there. Yeah, some of the somewhat more stormy parts on Threnody of Triumph or something. Yeah, that's on, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's um, where they also have a pretty you know thick guitar tone. Um. Mm-hmm. Uh. So here is uh. Here's another highlight. This is also early on the record because, and I think. This song, more than blinding, sort of typifies the writing approach for the rest of them. Uh, this is uh, Sister of Night, um, and this is this is a pretty, you know, uh, this is a, yeah, no, it's a five minute track. The next one, Death, is like eight minutes in a structure in a similar way to this, but this one's better, about significantly better. Um, you'll hear that, uh, you know, this guy seems to be comfortable with sort of a, uh, uh, sort of driving driving mid-tempo riffing uh, and more headbanging friendly than a lot of nowadays black metal is. So here's uh, from the middle of Sister of Night. Wake the night in the face No beauty looking away
So uh, there's another example of that kind of chorus style writing, right? It's something like bright eyes running away or bright eyes rotting away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, your beauty rotting away. So it sounds like a song about chasing a, chasing a woman through the woods and maybe mm-hmm. killing her or something, right? All right, classic. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, there's a kind of... Um, because the vocals are kind of audible and the lyrics can be made out, they play a much greater role in setting the vibe than they might otherwise. Um, uh, so there, right, you know, the verse riff is just kind of like, okay, bang your head, kind of, um, I don't know, uh, you know, dung da 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 dung da 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 kind of Bathorian or enslaved on Hordan's land or immortal or whatever, right? Uh, one of those mm-hmm. banger riffs. Um, there's more kind of subtlety in the bridge riff between the two vocal passages. We're like on a kind uh, on a kind of verse when it opens, and then there's some instrumental stuff, and then more of chorusy stuff. Um, and the instrumental part is a more kind of nuanced riffy guitar. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 da, da, da. It's it's a simple outline phrase and outline. I can't hum it, but there's like mm-hmm. really cool kind of passing tones in it and sort of feathering on the chords. Yeah, wanting well, I mean, to it puts it, what? Oh no, I was just going to say. I mean, all in all, I feel like you know. I mean, you, the, blinding is kind of an isolated track on this record. Yes. The majority of this, I would say, centers around ideas. Mostly from like Mayhem and Gorgoroth. Would you agree that's like the the basic units working here? You know, I think in terms of individual, well, that track towards the end, all the way down, might have the best single like blast rip, blast trem riff on here, and that is very sort of Gorgoroth meets Mayhem for sure. Uh, this stuff, I think. I think I would hear Burzum as being maybe the structure and influence on this band for this band. Yeah, Burzum definitely to a degree, especially because Death like, is like basically Jesu Dodd. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Dayeth or Dayeth or whatever it is. Yes, it is very close to the Jesus Todd riff. Um, it's you're always allowed, of course, to rip off someone's riff. Uh, Varg himself has done it. Um, yeah, but plenty. <laughs> but um, but you have to do it well. And this one is just this variant is not great, and uh, it's just moving around between the one and a half step down, and uh, pretty much rides that riff all the way through. But so, mm. although that is the weakest track on the record, it's where it becomes clear the principal structure in the rest of the songs. Yeah, which is like. Yeah. Okay, so it's like some of some of the con a lot of the content might be mayhemy or Gorgorothy type stuff, but the form of the songs is very berzumic. There's a lot of continuity from riff to riff, right? In Sister of Night, you could hear it was probably for a lot of people it's probably hard to tell when the verse riff changed to the, you know, changed to that bridge riff, changed back to the chorusy riff, right? Mm, um, yeah, lots of continuity riff to riff, uh, and um. Although, you know, the thing about Jesus Todd is although the guitar tone is deliberately kind of thin and spiky there, it's a real headbanging oriented double bass rumble track. And so he seems to be trying to bring out that kind of uh, latent heavy metal thunder in, you know, in late Burzum. Yeah, I get that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as uh, I have slowly become more of a convert to... Uh, your uh, your interest in black metal being heavy. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the more we've done the show, the more interested in that idea I am. And, uh, you know, so I think I can say uh, I appreciate I appreciate bands a lot more uh, going in that direction than I used to. Oh, well, that's, that's good, yeah. And this guy, this is certainly a good step. I would say, like, the basic vibe, right, and the, the sort of the core signature elements of the sound are established gotta work on the riffing more focus maybe around maybe make the riffing more burzumic but like better burzum riffs um (laughs) and uh, and i don't know that's just one way you could take it right but like 
you know, refine the Burzum thing and focus on how you want to fill in those structures with what kind of riffs. Of course, all the comments on the YouTube premiere on Black Metal Promotion, all the comments say, oh, the first song's the banger, right? Because they just want those, give me those Senor Volant riffs, put them in my <laughs> arm. Uh, um, but, like, I think that is um, not the direction he should take. Well, I think I, I think that I guess it's kind of weird to say, but you know, most of the people on Black Metal Promotion or like YouTube Black Metal Promotion channels in general are just so like universally positive about everything that's posted. The fact that opinions are more mixed about this suggests okay, there's something to it that we should keep going with and keep examining. Well said. All right, so uh, main show time. Uh, it's going to be so weird. We're just introducing like two records. What the fuck are we doing? Do we even have a show anymore? Not, uh, do we need to even introduce them? Oh, that's that's a good point. Yeah, we don't. We'll see you on the first one. This is a little one gash, and you're listening to Terminus. All right, so our first album of the evening is... Uh, from a band that I'm actually pretty excited to talk about because I've mentioned them on the show a couple of times as a, a longtime favorite of mine. Um, but uh, I didn't expect that uh, just out of nowhere they were going to have a new record. And this is the new record by, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Morte Incandescente titled Vala Comum out on Signal Rex. Um, so I've talked about uh, Morte and Candescente a few times on the show. I think I played one of their tracks as an interlude one time. Um, so these guys are a pretty, at this point, long-running uh, Portuguese black metal band, about 20 years old now. Uh, and they were a band, they were one of the first like deeply underground black metal bands I started really following and listening to when I was a kid, when I was Aww. like... 14, 15 years old. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, for those who don't know, Morte and Candescente is a two-piece with two guys that are very important to Portuguese black metal. Uh, one is going to be Volturius, uh, who is in a billion bands. Uh, the most important main thing of his being Iray. And then there is which Nocturne... Which we reviewed very Yeah, who we reviewed last history. year. Which I, was, I wasn't a big fan of that record, but he's done plenty of other stuff. It just depends on which project he's playing with as to how much I like it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other guy is Nocturnus Horrendous, who is one of the main people from Corpus Christi. And uh, Corpus Christi was a little bit earlier than Morte, but Morte and Ira started right around the same time. And... The impression that I get is that these guys are probably really good friends for like 20 years now, and they do all of these projects on their own, and then periodically they come together and do a Morte and Candescente record, you know? And I, I get the sense that they bash them out pretty quickly, you know? It's like, what have we learned? What kind of sound do we want to have? You know, let's let's knock out a new Morte and Candescente record. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been listening to these guys basically since the very first record, Your Funeral, back in 2003. Uh, their second record, Coffin Desecrators, is my favorite of their catalog. I think it's just one of the coolest underground black metal records ever for reasons that I can't even fully explain. Uh, I've been listening to it a lot over the past couple days. And uh, yeah, it's still awesome and still weird. Um, but uh, I'd like to get your opinion because as far as I know you haven't listened to like a full uh, Morte and Candescente record before right? No I have not um, this this scene was uh, highly respected by some old friends of mine so I've heard of these bands you know and probably heard stray songs but no Ire was my real first introduction the one we reviewed last year first introduction to this uh, this Portuguese scene um and uh, yeah, I I like this a lot. Um, it's a uh, the impression I get is um, the whole record is sort of trying to frustrate the distinction between like fun and serious black metal, and and sort of like depressive and affirmative black metal. Uh, mm -hmm. Seems like as it goes on, it gets weirder and weirder. Uh, and by the middle of the record, it becomes clear that they're sort of writing this with uh, 
it's like you hear more and more different kinds of riffs by the end mm-hmm. by the middle of the record you realize okay as you were kind of saying like all of their listening history is behind this record not just in black metal but outside it too right um, yeah in in sort of in sort of rock and roll and goth or post punk and uh, or just like punk um uh and um it's sort of um yeah nothing is put off the table from the beginning uh you know yeah i i th- and i think um i really like the attitude here uh which is is kind of um uh in some ways this music feels intensely depressive and miserable um, but it also feels like it's kind of fighting through it and fighting to have a good time and kind of like kind of kind of you know looking around at the uh, looking around at the sort of uh, bleak state of the world and cackling <laughs> um, so uh you know, I, I remember that Vol, uh, Volturius had an anecdote for the last Era record where he said he wrote the lyrics during when he was trapped in an airport during peak COVID, uh, sort of, and kind of like welcoming the plague, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is uh, this is more like uh, watching that all play out from back in the village pub. <laughs> no, actually, I I really like the notes that you wrote about this. They're they're much smarter than the things that I wrote. So, but no, I think you I think you reach something that's pretty important about Morte and Candace. So, I've always described Morte and Candacente as being like it's very dungeony black metal. You know, even from you know your funeral back in two thousand three, it always had this like raw kind of nasty you know dungeon atmosphere to it but the thing is like if you're if you're a black metal guy what does that mean it's like well you understand the trappings associated with that you understand that that's like a dark and depressing thing but you're also a black metal guy so you're kind of stoked about that too you know you 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 find a glee in negativity you know you find uh, this is gleefully negative for sure yeah, yeah, it's like it's like um, you know on uh, on coffin desecrators. There's a song called Black Skull Crushing Metal, and it's like there's plenty of songs on that record that have these beautiful mournful tremolo riffs and stuff. And then Black Skull Crushing Metal sounds exactly like the song title itself. <laughs> it is just moronic and bashing, and I think that that's always been part of what makes Morte and Candacente interesting is like this refusal to play into the, I guess the natural tropes of certain kinds of nowadays black metal. It's, it's full spectrum black metal, but in a very different sense, there's a complete refusal to let the, the mournful tremolo riff or the stomping dark throne riff are not there to indicate a certain emotion to you. You know? Hmm. Like, the, there's no there's no manipulation of the listener. There's no... The, these, these certain vocabulary elements of black metal are not there to teach you how to listen to it. This is about the experience of... I, I mean, maybe this sounds weird, but part of this wreck and part of this band is about the friendship between these two guys. Oh, I hear that for sure. How they how these records sound like they're bashed out, you know, in like a month. Um, which is not to say that they're not well-written songs, but they're deliberately unsophisticated. Um, so part of this is like, it's like listening to the evolution of this like probably best friendship between these two guys who have been just going in on the black metal scene for 25 years now. You know, uh, it's, it's interesting. It, like the mood that it produces as a result is, uh, it, it's a good sort of er black metal feeling. You know, the idea of when you're a guy that's been into this for so long, you recognize the feelings in this record really well. I think. Yeah, it's um, there's sort of a uh, 
and the approach to songwriting, right, is very, uh, as you might say, sort of, uh, you know, sort of craftsman, like craftsman, like kind of, uh, kind of maybe blocky. Here's this riff. Here's this riff. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. But the transitions are all really cool and often genuinely surprising. Uh, and um, you and they have the the way the riffs relate to each other you can tell that they were sort of written by jamming like okay oh yeah what sounds what sounds cool after this all right let's play around with it um there's uh despite the sort of uh style relative especially to what black metal has become this might scan a style like sort of kind of disjunctive in terms of its style right or Mm -hmm. disjointed you know i'm sorry that was an unnecessarily fancy word uh, disjointed in terms of a style, but it, it is not. There's a one mood continuing through all of it, which is kind of like what you were saying. And uh, um, the there is a momentum connecting all the parts. So let's listen to, for an example of that, here's just the... Uh, there are some great riffs on the first couple of tracks, but here's uh, number three, uh, Serra Os Dentes, which is... Uh, you know, just yeah, killer. Here, here's a riff sequence, and it's sick. So um, there is the thrash riff again, and if you're wondering whether the rest of the song is just that sequence once over again, the answer is yes. <laughs> Got a problem with that? Um, <laughs> it's uh, it works really well here. So something I realized as I was as we were listening to that is like. One thing that makes this work so well is that the unit here isn't the riff, it's the riff sequence. Uh, yeah. This this record is full of riffs. I mean, that's what it's built of. It's built of riffs, and each individual riff is worth listening to. Um, but uh, that entire first part we just ran through, you know, uh, is works to, you know, from that sort of like, 
the the sort of um, kind of almost killing jokey thrash riff to the you know or armored angel kind of thing to the you know to the dark throny blasting to the uh, massive sequence of Celtic frosty and breakdowns um, that that whole thing is like one unit that the, those all go together and within that there are sequences so like the blast part is not a single blast riff it's two blast riffs right there's the mm-hmm. second one that answers it right it's kind of escalates the mood there's the first one is more just power chordy the second one gets a little more that soaring uh da, 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 da. um soaring kind of epic tonality there um, and same with the you know stompy stuff. You don't just get um, that first kind of frost riff. You get that answering da 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 right sick downbeat stuff. Um, and um, you know yeah. I, I so I, I guess what I mean is that although all those riffs kind of count each part is more than just a single riff and the whole sequence is really really what matters this is not a this is not a riff deliver if you listen to this record as a sick riff delivery machine in the way that people seem to listen to black metal a lot these days that's not what you will find but you will find a lot of sick riffs yeah no i think that um i think the thing that you're getting at is that these are uh they are sequences, yes, but more importantly, they're they're not just riffs; they are parts of songs. Like the uh, the the riffs are inextricable from the drum beats. You're not going to hear like cool, subtle like drum variations. No, you know, a drum beat is bolted to a certain riff in the manner of jamming these songs out in a garage somewhere. Um, mm-hmm the blocky nature of this music is crucial to its overall effect you know just the these sort of unchanging immutable blocks of everything happening simultaneously being crucial to its to its ultimate effect i get the sense that it, it, it's amazing how off the cuff this feels like especially with the the super sharp transitions it almost feels improvisational like maybe like these are guys who are very familiar with each other and each other's mm-hmm. styles but they've only played these songs together like 5 times before and they were like fuck it that's good let's go let's just go into the studio let's knock them out um and i think that's one of the coolest things about this record is how it, it really does bring back that vibe of, like, you know, rehearsal tape black metal, you know, uh, that's entirely supported by just how tight the connection between these guys is. And the other part of it is that it's not really distinct uh, on any Morte and Candescente record who plays what. Like, um, like uh, Nocturnus Horrendous is pretty much always the drummer, but it seems like everything else the vocals the guitar the bass is a mix and match between both of these guys Mm. um you know so there's probably different guys singing on different songs you'll pick up on bizarre stuff in the background like at the very end of that sample you'll hear some like very faint vocal stuff in the background i think that might just be the the grumber the, the excuse me the drummer sort of grumbling the lyrics to himself before they come in you know, so something like that. You know, the the rehearsal room atmosphere of this record is so awesome. Is part would, would of the charm say, of this whole thing. Would you say they recorded the drums and probably like drums and rhythm guitar at the same time, at least? Almost certainly. Yeah. This this sounds like a live recording. Well, I mean, we'll get to the parts that are obviously this is a live recording. Yeah. Um, but real quick, I'll go to one of mine. So this is off the the following track after yours. This is Oveo. And so I like to describe Morte and Candescente for people who can't, who haven't heard them before, as like a perfect midpoint between like Panzerfaust by Dark Throne and Remains of a Ruined Dead Cursed Soul by Mutilation. You know, it's it's rickety, it's stompy, it's depressive, but it's also just got a lot of just distinct energy to it. Um, 
So here you're going to have a, a really interesting sequence of riffs. You're going to have like a really mutilation riff up front, and you're going to have this really cool sort of crossing the triangle of flames, like stumbling Dark Throne riff. But then we're going to get into a kind of what, as I like to call on the show, 1.5 wave black metal riff, uh, which is something you'll hear in like weird parts of Old Bathory and some other stuff from around that era which is something remarkably similar to Johnny Rivers' Secret Agent Man. So <laughs> let's let's listen to this clip and I, I want to see if you're uh, I want to see if you're able to spot the one that I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? But you've heard you've heard that before, especially in like early kind of primitive like proto black stuff, haven't you? Heard things like that. I mean, the rhythm is certainly like "Welcome to Hell," which we sampled a while ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's because yeah. that's because Fathom literally uh, literally ripped off that riff. Um, but um, uh, dun, 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 dun. so I, and there I've heard intervals like that. I think I told you once somebody um. Some some metal ar- astute metal archives reviewer ruined some uh, under the sign of the black mark song for me by saying uh, maybe Equibanthorn I can't remember by saying that it sounded like the Jaws theme. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, that's that was all power chords, right? That was just like <laughs> right, um, sort of stretched out, but um, it had that same kind of old. Uh, old movie spoopy vibe and once I heard that I couldn't unhear it but are you saying there's parts on Bathory Records that have that like on like one and two that have kind of that corded <laughs> style rock and rolly cording oh I think so definitely because I just went through uh, I went through a session of listening to like the entire Bathory discography like early this year or late last year mm-hmm. um and I, it, it was it was kind of interesting to listen to all those records laid end to end, especially the first four or so, which are in a sense all kind of the same record. Mm-hmm. Um, and hearing just how much kind of like, just like rock and roll and blues is buried underneath all the kind of crazy noise of it, mm-hmm. um, which is something that you know Corthon like never really denied in interviews, you know, just how much of that really was in there. Um, But it was also listening to 
listening to this Morte and Candescente record, I was like, man, there's a lot of just like straight Bathory and Venom stuff across this whole record. And I thought it was kind of a newer thing, but then I, just listening to Coffin Desecrators, I was like, oh no, it's always been there. It's just back when I was a kid, this sounded so much crazier. Now, now I can correctly identify the origin for some of these ideas, you know? Uh, th there's always been this big slab of, like, 1.5 wave in this band's music, and oh, it, it I was just gonna took say a while to realize it. Kinda, the, the only thing that makes it not fit that 1.5 wave idea is the, the s sort of strangely corded mutilation type stuff. Mm-hmm, yeah. And it's interesting how... It, as that style, that kind of 1.5 wave stuff has really come back, I would say, mm -hmm. in a big way over the past few years. Nobody's ever really looked back at Morte and Candescente as being like a natural fit for that. Yeah, and you know, there's a way that the kind of, um, uh, you know, sour, grumbling Frenchman vibe of the mutilation type stuff, that sort of urban depressive tone actually blends with the rock and rollisms mm -hmm. uh, yeah uh, throughout on this record like so you you know the rock and roll riff there also is kind of like noirish and uh, sort of misanthropic right um that's that's another way that this this band is constantly blurring uh, refusing ways we expect refusing later conventions about how certain kinds of riffs are supposed to be used you know so like oh you know oh here's here's the rock and rolly bathory esque riff well that has to be just like the fun riff right mm -hmm. um, yeah but uh it, it doesn't it could also be the real bad vibes bad trip riff right yeah, it's a, it is surprisingly negged out despite being Secret Agent Man, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, and the way they're courting it is kind of still has that killing joke kind of vibe as well. Uh, the syncopation. Dun, 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 dun. Although that's in Secret Agent Man. You know, I had never heard Secret Agent Man uh, before this. Or, I mean, I'm sure I'd heard it in some sort of context, but I didn't know what it was. Should we play it for our younger if if i don't know what it is should we play it for our younger listeners yeah sure let's listen to a clip from secret agent man <laughs> That you find a pretty face can hide an evil mind. Oh, be careful what you say, or you give yourself away. Odds are you won't live to see tomorrow. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it, it's interesting because like the way you get the aggregate effect of that riff is a combination of the guitar and the vocals, but but you see how like the midpoint of it becomes that kind of riff, this sort of like almost like proto thrash heavy metal riff, and then of course just that like weird sawing chromatic stuff yeah, dear, that really dear, is dear, the main dear, riff. Dear, 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 dear. Yeah. Da, 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 da. I mean, that's just a grind riff, you know. If you lose the <laughs> ornamentation, it's it's very it's very unusual, actually. It's a, it's it's interesting stuff, but uh, but 
we're, we're, we're done with that. Let's get back to more Dan Candesente. What do you have? <laughs> uh, so, um, well, yeah. So in terms of, well, you know, in terms of, say, a uh, kind of uh, vague, you know, uh, in a vaguely Latin country rock riff actually being a grind riff. Um, again, in terms of these sort of riffs that refuse expectations about mood, uh, I, you know, here here is an you know, just that song we were playing. Oh, Vu has another really good one in that like the stompy blast part or the really stompy part, the dark throne kind of part with the dar 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 mm -hmm. sort of downbeat half blasts that it's less like or nowadays or like a, a trendy band would make the mutilation riff the big sort of triumphant part the payoff yeah um and here they generate the triumphant feeling by dropping out of the mutilation riff into the black skull crushing metal riff yes right? um, yes uh it's like shake your fist right um <laughs> you know so so in terms of like blending the uh, you know, making ep epic or triumphant parts with tools that are often pigeonholed for gritty or aggressive parts. Here's another one. This is uh, from O Uivo da Noite. Noite? I don't know. I no, presume you take, that probably. has. I, you know, yeah, I'm just going to guess that that has something to do with wolves and the night, but, you know, you never know. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, here, here's another example of that doing the epic part with the gritty part. that track is over <laughs> right a lot of these oh, have man. these they, they kind of have these um you know uh live they they leave off they leave on basically every you know all sorts of traces of the recording right so they're there and elsewhere right you just get the uh it's 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 really not how you finish a song on a sort of uh, caref meticulously produced atmospheric full length record or something right it's how you finish it when you're bashing it out in the rehearsal room uh, and uh, you know even just that idea of like how do we finish the song oh we play the six speed metal riff but like we just bash it yeah yeah no, I, I love how um, some of these songs end with just, like, you can hear the drummer drop his sticks and kind of, like, go, woo, and then they say something to each other in Portuguese and it just cuts off. Leaving that in is wonderful. We, we should all be doing that all the time, I think. <laughs> I for sure agree, yeah, in terms of, like, this record is, you know, this record may, might not have, like, sort of out improv parts like, say, Antediluvian or, you know, Sorguinazia or whatever, 
or maybe not sorbonazia, that's not as improvised, but antediluvian or some other things we've covered this year have some more open improvisation in them. This, Mm -hmm. you know, this is more sort of, okay, you jam it to find the riffs, um, but, like, the spontaneous live band, full band energy is just crucial to this. Um, Also, you know, in terms of the point about the songwriting, right, it's just that, like, very often when a band drops a Bathory speed, you know, satanic speed metal riff into a song, it says the sort of like greasy, sleazy, evil sounding riff, right? But here that is the sort of, uh, you know, shake your fist at the moon sort of epic triumphant riff, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. From uh, an era where there was no distinction between those things. Yes. Also, uh, the uh the, <laughs> the rounding the phrase off with a, a non repeating harmonica blast beat section <laughs> <laughs> every time i listen to this every time i listen to this record that shit always takes me by surprise and i love uh, me it me too <laughs> i was like i, I was like yes <laughs> It's, it's like, he, yeah, of course. And the, the crazy thing is, it doesn't even sound, it's surprising, but it does not sound incongruous at it's all. Not incongruous it, it seems at all. natural as fuck, you know? It's, it's, yeah, it makes sense. They should do it more. But, um, you know, there's so many bands out there trying to, like, break, break the mold, smash the template, like, wild, genre combining, innovative, whatever. These guys just, like, do what they want and make far more, uh, Far more, far more of an impact. Yeah, yeah. Far you don't. You don't. Impact. Yeah. You don't break the template by trying to break break the template. You break it by just not caring that it exists. You know. Yeah. By just it's, doing your own thing, and you stumble into just weird brilliance like that. Yeah, you've got the um, and you know, you got some more of that. Obviously, rock and roll, the harmonica thing, and that sort of passage of. In that passage of a more arpeggiated guitar, you get basically the perfect 50-50 of the secret agent man vibe and the kind of uh, <laughs> sort of gothy post-punk vibe, or the or really the mutilation thing, right? Uh, yeah. And well, I mean, and then we were talking during that sample because we haven't even mentioned it. But another thing that does kind of break that mold unintentionally is the vocal performance across this record, which is just like howling and yelping and kind of half-spoken word and goblin grumbling. It's whatever the fuck they feel like for any particular section. And you can tell they're trading off with each other non-stop, the two members. It's like, oh, I want to sing this one, but you just kind of, like, yell whenever you want to. Yes. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, no, like, free... That's, every, that's certainly something that, you know, more people should look at. Free yelling. Um, yeah, why, why are why we not, not? just... Why are we not just screeching? Like, why isn't everyone in the band just screeching whenever they feel if, like if it? The goal <laughs> is to make like as much noise as possible, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> I've seriously thought that before. It's um, so this is this is a great approach. Um, you know, the vibe on this record is like is so just like, you know, it, it, right? In I don't know exactly how it is in Portugal, but often in Europe, you're allowed to drink outside. And I just imagine, like, people standing, dudes standing outside the pub with their drinks, sort of smoking and intermittently spitting on the sidewalk with, like, a lot of vehemence. Yeah, and, and, and just, like, and sne- singing snatches of Bathory lyrics together, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, to, to wrap it up, let me get to uh, my last sample. Um, this is off uh, As Luzes da Cidade. Um, so this is a little bit more like older Morte and Candescente stuff in the way that it's arranged and I don't have a ton to say about it apart from all of these riffs are sick um, this is another song like most of them it's just like three or four riffs total a lot of them are just repeating and interrupting each other but I want to draw a lot of attention to this awesome palm muted riff that'll be used as mm. an interrupter between various sections because Morte has always been really into kind of right-hand guitar work. There's there's actually, like, tr- a true tremolo riffs make up maybe 15% of this record. It's mostly yeah, yeah, pretty... Yeah. It's pretty sharply defined rhythmically. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I mean, as, as far as just, like, bulldozering, palm-muted black metal riffs, I mean, this, this has well, a great one. You've got my attention. <laughs>
it, all of those riffs are just fucking stellar. They're all really simple. They should be too primordial to work, but they're all awesome. And those palm muted riffs are just it's it's so interesting the flavor that they have like you were saying earlier a, a lot of the stuff has this kind of noirish feel to it it's kind mm-hmm. of like uh darkly mysterious but not in a mayhem way almost in a more like urban way I, it's very hard to describe you know you get the sense of people displaced in time living in modernity from this music i i guess which is a, a very precise, maybe pretentious thing for me to say, but that's kind of the vibe I get oh. off this. It's like, you know. Oh. And, and isn't that, like, the black metal vibe? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
are back from debating the pros and cons of integrity gym shorts with Mortality Salience by Psionic Madness out now on or out in a couple days on Vargeist Records. Uh, so this was uh, sent to us by the good folks at Vargeist, uh, that is the Vargeist himself, um, and uh, which, by the way, trivia, that's a creature in Warhammer, a vampire. Oh, is it? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, um, but, um, so this, you know, this label has, uh, has some good stuff. It's kind of an out there, out there, dirty, grinding death metal label. And we last reviewed Ma- uh, Maggot Crown. Right? Yeah. Um, and, and the, this band shares a member or two members with Maggot Crown, right? Yeah. Uh, we, and so you that's, know the so, lineup better. Yeah, so it's Jared, uh, who is all the instruments on Maggot Crown, on drums. He's also been in Evaporated Sores, uh, who we covered last year, and is in approximately 50 other bands, so we've probably covered him without knowing it a couple more times on the show. Um, I believe it's Justin on vocals here, uh, if I'm remembering that correctly, his name is Justin. Well, why don't I just look it up and, instead of being an idiot? <clears throat> uh, oh, yeah. And yes, the, uh... it is Justin. Uh, Justin on vocals, who is also the vocalist for Maggot Crown. But then uh, on strings, uh, we have a guy, I believe it is Nicholas uh, from Nothing Is Real. Uh, which, as far as I know, is kind of like an experimental doom band, like a little bit stonery, a little bit psych, but I think he does like a lot of different stuff on different records, and he's pretty prolific. Um, so this is all three of them joining forces. Now, nothing is real I'm not super familiar with, but I know the guys, uh, our buddies on Cave Dweller Music, are really tight uh, with uh, Nothing is Real and really like those records. So might be something worth checking out at one point word so um so yeah this this record uh this is um so the psionic madness you know there there are some similarities to maggot crown i think you know the biggest simil- similarity is like i think you could broadly say this is death grind too right yeah yeah the or, the grind or maybe stuff comes maybe out more, more weight m- more weight on the death metal grinding death metal yeah 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 that's fair mm mm-hmm. mhm yeah, so so Maggot Crown is death grind. This is grinding death metal. Uh, and um, what sets it apart is that, if, you know, like okay, grind, that that label might suggest a focus purely on um, delivering weighty low end as fast as possible, or sort of um, uh, sort of choppy dissonant technicality. This band, this music is fairly. Musicy. It's not necessarily technical, <laughs> but it's very sounds difficult to play. Um, it, it and it is, uh, but there is more colorful guitar work on this than you might expect from grinding death metal. Uh, it, this is listed as black death grind, but I think that's just as we talk about on the show the black metal hegemony thing, where every time someone plays some guitar part that has some cording or some color to it, they're like, ah, oh, black metal. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, you get a little bit of black metal peaks up towards the end of the record in a more like traditional sense, but for the most part, yeah, this is this is a fast death metal record. Yeah, you can hear black metal riffs or melodies that wouldn't sound out of place in a black metal context, but it's the spirit is o- overwhelmingly death metal. Um, mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, these are short, high-energy songs uh, where a lot happens, and they have this kind of... I think you noticed and said well, and I, I think... You know, this is something we talked about with Maggot Crown too. This sort of like careening edge of one seat quality, where the music is uh, sort of um, achieves its power in part by barely, barely coherent. Yeah, I, I think a lot of that has to do with Jared's drumming. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm starting to get more in tune with his style, which is fast and technical 
but also very kind of loose and shotgunning in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a, there, you get that really extreme like expand and contract feeling with a lot of his blast sections. Yeah, 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 for uh, sure. You know, a lot of his fills are super abrupt. I really like his drumming. I think it's really interesting, and it's interesting to hear other musicians kind of contort the way they write around that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um. Yeah, well, I think we've talked about a sort of it's it's musical drum playing, and the uh, even in in one of my samples, you get sort of actually let's listen to my sample. Uh, okay. This this is a, a short one, and yeah, of course, I picked the thrash one, right? But um, <laughs> this there's an extended passage at the beginning where you get some isolated. Uh, drum and bass timbre uh and um that you can hear that there's a kind of um there there's tonality built into the way jared plays drums So how would you describe that snare? The snare sounds like woody, kind of. Almost like he's hitting a wood block or something. Yeah, I, I think that Jared... Um, but Because the thing is, so Jared is down in Mississippi, last I heard, and most of his projects tend to be remote um, with people around the country. Just, you know, like internet buddies of his, and I think that's the case here. Um, so I think that he's kind of got a a set recording pattern for his drums. I'm sure he modifies it here and there, but he tends to, at least to my ear, really like super acoustic, super live sounding drums. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that's a result of probably a a relatively limited mic setup Mm -hmm. um, and just kind of a deeper, more resonant snare than you typically hear in kind of like fast death metal bands these days. Yeah, well, I like that sound a lot, and I like the sort of bulldozer tone on the bass. Um, Mm -hmm. You also get some... um, You can hear... uh, The beginning has some simple, riffy trem work in the guitar, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a good, just sort of, like, strong power chord death metal riff. But um, over that, you get some of that kind of fried outside guitar work that we've been finding in you know, Sorbonazzi, Antediluvian, that I just kind of referenced in the last, uh, in the Morte Incandescent uh, uh, review just now. Um, Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I think that's mostly what I wanted to highlight is just for people, the, the, uh, the sort of cool, tonally varied uh, drum kit sound. Well, I mean, tonal variation is kind of the name of the game across this whole record. Um, you know, because you're get, you're getting that from the drums, you're also getting it through a really remarkably dynamic guitar performance. I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of riffs across this record. Um, you've got more traditional stuff. Um, I, I was thinking about this. It, it's a little bit hard to pin down, but long shot ideas. I think the influences here are. There's a lot of, like, kind of the weirder edges of earlier Nile, like uh, Black Seeds of Vengeance era, maybe uh, early Mithras. 
a lot of stuff like connecting to Morbid Angel, like uh, a little bit of the chasm. Uh, just in some of these, like, they're using these same kind of, like, odd, psychedelic, twisted note choices, but they're executed in a way that kind of suggests something more epic, you know, as well as a lot, you know, mm-hmm. the, these, the Phrygian scales you're hearing a lot. But those are owing a lot more to older death metal doing stuff with that than, like, modern behemoth type shit. Um, so like I was saying, so tonal color and tonal variation is the name of the game here. You know, the vocals, they're soaked in a lot of reverb and delay. You know, they're supposed to sound especially monstrous and especially wet. Uh, oh, th- that's something worth pointing out while I remember it from that sample with the vocalist, with the vocals. Mm-hmm. Um, there are gutturals on here, which... Yeah, yeah. Brutal death gutturals, which are very often sort of segregated off from this world of more, uh basically raw raw death metal with different kinds of cover art right um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. like, uh, that's, that's a good description raw death metal with different kinds of cover art that's really what it comes down to a lot of the time isn't it? yeah yeah but so it's, it's good to hear uh, you know an effective use of vocals that are often used in highly processed production in this more raw context and good to hear a band that doesn't see the artificial barrier there right they they can draw on brutal death if they want to anyway continue you were talking about tone well no i well i mean you're you're kind of touching on the same thing that i'm talking about i i one of the big things i like about this band is the idea that there is not that artificial segregation stylistically i mean you can tell that there's influences from all over the map here obviously all of these guys are listening to old school death metal as well as brutal death as well as modern stuff informed by black metal and more kind of dissonant ulcerate related kind of stuff but it never feels like they're imitating anything in particular it sounds like they are trying to come up with a unified idea of a new kind of execution for the style. I mean, I, I, I guess I can see how this is going to... This is going to naturally be connected to kind of diso-death stuff. Um, by, by like, just random people and fans and stuff. Which is not unfair. It, it bears some resemblance to that. But ultimately, there's a ton of just, like, very straightforward old incantation and morbid angel bubbling under the surface and more true to those original things than the kind of like perverted version of them that have been typified now is this making any sense no for sure i mean so yeah there was one diso death riff at the very end of that the sort of uh ar- arpeggio sort of climbing at, at the uh at the end where it fades out of that last sample but um by and large the dna of this riffing is not uh you know it's like power chords and leads and there's often like kind of dorian scale ideas with tritones thrown in and stuff like the tonality is what makes the music sound really crazy is the sort of uh the meshing of the drums and of the guitars and the vocals and the fact that the bass is more forward in the mix than you're used to and uh Mm -hmm. you know the 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 drum timbre coming through right it's um it's not um I mean, obviously they're hitting weird dissonant intervals at times because it's death metal, right? But the yeah, the, that the used count, to ju- diso death. I mean, would that used to just be death metal, death, guys? I, I know, <laughs> yeah, like or like, um, you know. So the yeah, the, you know, there's not much ulcerator DSO here, uh, and I imagine there must be um, death metal roots for some of the weird cording here. Uh, oh yeah, I mean, like as far like, as just like, uh, it just abstract, corded, brutal death stuff that was like, I mean, there's tons of stuff like that, literating, you know, like the United Guttural and Unmatched Brutality catalogs in the late '90s and early 2000s that nobody's fucking heard of. Um, in terms of, in terms of scronky arpeggiated stuff, Akerkaka, which is way more a death metal band than a black metal band. Oh yeah, and but then there's a, there's a lot of bands that just did like an EP or two back in the day, or uh, yeah, a, yeah, a, yeah. a deep cut thing that's coming back for some reason. I, I've seen like Hessian Firm guys talking about this recently. Um, a, a band called Morbius. Uh, they did a record. They did a couple records, but the big one is called like Sojourns to the Septiac. It's a, a very a like. Title. 
it's a very early kind of well, not super early, you know, I was late '90s, early 2000s attempt at uh, sort of spacey death metal, but without without the you know mannered idea of that that's become established nowadays. It's really cool. Like you, you would probably find a lot to appreciate about it. Right. Um, so let me get to one of my samples. So, Sanity, a Euclidean prison. Um, this is going to be the back half of this track, and there's there's a reason I'm going to choose back halves for both my samples, and I'll talk about it a little bit here. Um, really fascinating guitar ideas here. You've got a wonderful kind of hybridized um, major meets minor key riff near the start, like some of the coolest cryptopsy riffs are like that. You're going to have dissonant stuff that's actually used as sort of like noisy texture rather than as like a filler riff derived from orthodox technique and a bunch of cool stuff toward the end but then as it wraps up let's let me talk about what i think some of the limitations at play here are Okay, so, like I said, tons of cool idea guitars, idea guitars, guitar ideas bouncing around this whole section. I mean, that's like four or five discrete riffs, all of which have something unique to offer. It's structurally really interesting, the way the riffs and the drums keep kind of slipping against each other. One introduces the other, and then it'll reverse for the next riff. It, it's, it's really compelling stuff, but then as it, to me, feels like it's really getting going, oh, the song just kind of ends. And that was a consistent thing I felt across this record. Yes, Black Metal Guy, for the first time, I think, ever in the history of this podcast, I am saying a band should write longer songs. <laughs> Which is honestly such a vanishingly rare thing for me. I, I have become such a huge proponent of, like, brevity... And just being like high impact and punchy, but for me, when I hear, I hear these songs and I hear these fascinating riff ideas, I just wish they had more room to grow. I mean, the average song length on this is like a hair over three minutes. I wish that it was a hair over five. I think a couple more minutes per track, you know, with all these like dense ideas, would really give them room to accomplish what they're setting out to. That song was just getting to the good part. Um, yeah, yeah. You had all this wonderful, dynamic, like, developmental stuff. All of it's great, but it's mm -hmm. clearly developmental. And then when that cool, mm -hmm. kind of simple, you know, chugging over double kick riff comes in, it's like, okay, now we're introducing, like, the back half of the song where this is going to really launch. But then it kind of peters out. Uh, and that's that's something that seems to happen a lot of times over the course of this record. Happens it happens really sharply at the end of Mephitic Abattoir too, and we could probably name a number of other songs. Then that's the last track on the record. Who knows? Maybe you know this record's called Mortality Salience. It's supposed to deal with you know the horror of realizing that you know death is inescapable, and you know the psychic 
you know, sort of psychic disturbance and whatnot that follows from that. But, um, so who knows? Maybe the songs are supposed to just kind of die. Mm -hmm. Um, but, like, that's, I mean, surely you can give songs sudden endings or, uh, strange endings after playing the good riffs longer. Right. <laughs> and I mean, you know, I, I th- there were plenty of other good riffs in that sample. I don't mean to be Mr. Big Riff Guy, right? But um, th- there were plenty of other interesting riffs there. But it's at the end of the sample where, like, it, you know, in that case, it does have a pretty just classic sort of epic minor scale melody. It wouldn't have to be. But really what's at stake there is they just start repeating themselves long enough to build atmosphere, Right, and yeah. the and developmental I think character doesn't drop out. It doesn't just. It it's just they start developing a couple related melodies rather than sort of crashing them off each other. Well, and that and you're you're touching on something that's important, which is it in these brief moments these guys do create really interesting atmospheres, and uh, they do touch on ideas that are super exciting to me even as a guy that's listened to all kinds of like weird and technical and progressive death metal there's stuff going on this record that's actually kind of new you know the really loose playing these super like fast like constantly morphing song structures they're they're awesome i just wish we had more time with them to kind of explore those spaces I mean, yeah, that's one reason I wasn't that into, like, grindy stuff or even more technical death metal when I was younger, right? I saw them as too spazzy. Uh, and, mm-hmm. of course, I've... Which is interesting. It's interesting because this isn't spazzy at all. It's actually kind of relaxed feeling a lot of the time. Just, just, just to me, I guess, changing the riff too fast to headbang to it. Oh, I, I, I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, and, and for sure, like, I've, you know, I don't know, I loved that fucking internal rot you brought on a while ago, right? Um, yeah, yeah. You know, like, obviously that's a kind of youthful listening prejudice that you, you get around, but dude, there there is something to it, and part of it's just my taste as a black metal guy. I like repetition, but in certain contexts, it helps. And so, you know, that so that, your criticism ties in with mine, which is really like, this record seems to aspire to that kind of atmosphere and in these moments where they focus and uh, intensify concentrate uh, repeat like I just repeated three versions of the same fucking word Um, in those moments when they do that uh, they can build this kind of um, you know gloomy gloomy sort of space gothic atmosphere where somehow a lot is happening um, there, there, right? it, I always get the but, sense at the end of these songs of like some sort of terrible monolith on the horizon but we never get to ride up to meet it and actually see the, the horrible things that are etched into it you know yeah yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I want to read those inscriptions um, uh, yeah so like and I think so, like, for the most part, right, the sort of the sort of crashing stuff that happens at the first part of the song, and for, like, two-thirds of most of these songs, is all pretty engaging as, like, mus- as playing. Like, as, you're right, as people who are, like, interested in music, that's, like, exciting in the way listening to jazz is exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's kind of, like, heavy and loud, and there are some cool riffs, but it is not generating that atmosphere right the only atmosphere that stuff generates is kind of being spacey being wild right which just gives it puts it in the territory of a bu- of a bunch of sort of like groovy stoner space death metal that I don't think this music really has anything to do with at its core and I doubt these guys like right well um, I think I think part of that is going to be a matter of taste because a lot of the like the more aggressive churning stuff at the front of tracks I, I'm probably more into than you but that's more like brutal death background stuff I mean I, I like things that move at that I like the in some way I like the pacing you know just when I hear it it's not in terms of the atmosphere it's not adding up to anything except mm-hmm. like being spacey and crazy uh, I gotcha. And, yeah. and so, like, but it seems like this band wants to get beyond spacey and crazy to some sort of, like, higher level of 
clarity as to what the atmosphere is and higher level of intensity, right? They want it to be gripping and in some way kind of serious. Mm -hmm. So uh, that sets the challenge of, of how you do that. Um, here's a uh, here's a sample where I think they do it well, uh, where there's concentrated atmosphere. I think maybe the most on the record. Uh, and um, and so this is on cathartic suicide denied. So there you get that sort of uh, that stacking of phrases. I'm I'm not gonna get all those intervals. Uh, no, I get I get it. It's it definitely it piles up in the way that more traditional death metal does. That that's very incantation there also. The kind of progression there. Oh, for sure, yeah. The basic riff is very incantation, and, like, it sort of... You can, like, hear a shape... Th you know, that's a thing. Like, a lot of this... The more sort of chaotic stuff on here, there are not necessarily audible shapes to it. Here, mm -hmm. there is a clearly defined structure happening, right? And it is like... It's a space cathedral with horrible inscriptions on it, right? It's, um, a, it's, a, it's, it's a Necron tomb ship, right? Exactly, exactly. Something like that. Um, ne Necron Tomb Ship, I like that, yeah. Um, and it is, it, like, you can hear this sort of, even the tonality to that riff is interesting and m marks out a distinctive mood space, right? And then... And, and that's about as long as they sustain that kind of development on the record, because, you know, then the song just goes back to big old Chuggo riff. I mean, that Chug riff is kind of cool, but um, the song just ends. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I guess we're basically circling around the same issues, which is like, I guess it's kind of a, a backhanded thing. It's just like, we, we really just want more of what you guys are doing maybe with a, a touch less nervous energy. I mean, we were talking about this before we got on. I, you know, I had the idea that maybe this music just doesn't need to be as chaotic as it is. You know, I, I get the idea of it and I appreciate the idea of trying to use these very chaotic kind of patterns to generate this sort of abstract atmosphere. Uh, I really like sort of counterintuitive stuff like that. But I think with the the shape of these riffs I, i'm just thinking melodically here for a moment with the the kind of phrasing going on on this record i'm wondering if maybe pairing back the most intensely kind of grinding ideas and making this just a hair more organized would ultimately be to the service of the songs you know yeah you keep the loose aggressive playing and the energy right you keep the rawness but the you give give more sort of uh Direction, and I think ultimately more intensity to the songwriting. Yeah, no, I agree with you on that. I I think that I I think that something is being reached at here. That's 
obviously infinitely better than anything Blood Incantation's ever done. You know? <laughs> but, uh, well, for sure. And I do. Uh, yeah, I guess. I guess that name has been sort of hiding unspoken on the back of my tongue for the whole. Review, oh right? yeah, it's yeah. Like, of course. It's like I mean, yeah. I mean, which is not fair because like people have been doing stuff aesthetically like Blood Incantation for basically as long as Death Metal's fucking existed. For sure. But, for sure. Currently, it is all blood incantation now. Um, who are? You know, let me clarify for people listening at home: they are not the worst band in the world. I'm just very tired of everyone who loves them so much. They suck. Um, <laughs> 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 eh, kind of. Well, they're they're nice guys though. But whatever. Um, anyway, so. Uh, I think maybe another idea is going back to uh, a band that I feel like all these guys clearly listen to a lot of, which is Cryptopsy, um, who are able to generate atmosphere even within very tight, compressed songs, Uh, just mm -hmm. based off of kind of like meta arrangement, you know, Uh, like a a perfect example... uh, like, I, I think a great kind of, like, map for these guys would be Lich Mistress off of None So Vile. It's a two-and-a-half-minute song that manages to be very chaotic, very dynamic, and still generate unbelievable atmosphere just through this very careful plotting and assemblage of different parts. And I think there's points on this record where they're accessing something close to that. So let me get to my last sample. Uh, this is toward the end of the record. And I think that the end of this record gestures to ideas that are a little bit more established. They sound a little more comfortable with themselves at the end of the record for me. Um, So this is off Grotesque Laughter Consumes. We're going to do the back half of this track again. Um, And here, things are going to fit together a little bit more neatly. There's a... there's a, a consistent thread running through all of these riffs. It's still aggressive, it's still chaotic, but it feels like everything's hanging together a little bit better on this track. So again, it's ending too early, but that is really put together there to me. I mean, I I think that in terms of where it falls on the album, it's designed to be the simpler, more epic track. Mm -hmm. But I think that that really makes sense. Um, And I think that even if they like chopped it up with some more of those kind of dissonant, grindy riffs, but kept coming back to that central sort of almost behemoth or nile idea it would still work almost but like it's got uh it's quite kind of beautiful right i mean oh yeah that's a good well that's because of the 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 harmonic ideas are fascinating i was gonna say yeah we haven't really talked about that but this there are a few parts on the record where he uses these chorus like i think chorus pedal stuff to do the second layer of guitar and yeah 
that this sort of like light film of just these soaring harmonies over things. Uh, really cool and really weird. Uh, really weird but very intuitive musical and like beautiful ways of harmonizing things. He does it at the beginning of the record too. Yeah, there's there's some really there's some really interesting like super heavily layered guitar stuff going on at various mm-hmm. points on this record that I think is a real point of strength and I think should yeah. be expanded upon because I think that certain layers are like semi improvised. Um, he's got a general outline of an idea, but he's playing around within it, um, and I think that that maybe that is the central thread that can still work with the kind of chaotic idea in the back of this is let's have maybe song structures that are a little bit tighter, maybe a little bit more organized, but let's keep the kind of wild textural ideas that we both seem to really like here. 